Good afternoon. There's no special occasion today. I dress this way because I'm cold. I was on my way here, I was caught in the rain, and my body is still recovering from cold, flu, and cough. So, excuse me if I, my voice changed halfway. <clears throat> Many years ago, about maybe possibly about 30 years ago, there's this show, and this show is quite an interesting show. It comes with two titles, depending on which country you watch this show. No, and uh, some countries show this as accidental hero. Some countries just have the word hero. And, and the direct, uh, uh, author, the, the key, key uh, actor is uh, Dustin Hoffman and also Andy Garcia. I don't know whether, how, how many of you have watched this show. And it's quite an interesting show showing that this um, Dustin Hoffman was a down and out petty criminal. He's divorced and he is, um, his only son lives with him. But he's not in a good term with his son. You know, and um, so once he was going back home and he witnessed an airplane crash near him. You know, and uh, there were a lot of injured passengers crying for help. So he got up and he went to push open the door of the plane. So he saved quite a few of people. But in the whole process, he was very grumpy, was complaining. He was totally unwilling. But in the process, he saved all the survivors. All of them, when the plane was already on fire, he managed to save all of them before the whole plane blew up. You know, and, uh, and this is a comedy, of course, and it's not a real thing, but the twist of the story is this, that the one who was recognized for this heroic act is not him, it's Andy Garcia, you know, which, which is another actor here. And Andy Garcia received, in the show, received a one million reward for saving the people in the plane, and not... Uh, uh, and not the key actor, uh, Dustin Hoffman himself, you know, so in, and uh, the portrayal of a hero here in this show is someone who is down and out in his personal life, in his marriage life and even while doing this heroic act, actually the show shows that while he was saving a lady, he saw her purse drop out and he quickly kept the purse for himself, then he brought the lady out and he stole the valuables from this purse himself you know, this is the kind of heroes that, he, that, that was portrayed here. You know, and uh, of course, in our church today, we do not need any heroes. Right? Although, um, in our church history, a lot of bio, uh, autobiographers actually portrayed and bring out a lot of so-called heroes, thousands and hundreds and thousands of them, or heroines. You know? But we must understand our only hero, our only hero that we have, whether it's in the Bible or in our church history, it's only one person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know, and it's not any leaders, definitely not, not missionaries, not some great theologians that have shook the world with their books or something. No, our only heroes is the Lord Jesus himself. Right? But nevertheless, the Lord Jesus himself instructs us to elect good leaders, you know, leaders who will lead the church on his behalf. No. So we ask ourselves, what kind of leader is needed? What kind of leader will be needed to lead Christ's church on his behalf? So my title today is this. Can the real leader please stand up? Last two weeks we have, uh, can the real man please stand up? Can the real woman please stand up? Today we have, can the real leader please stand up? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we pray for your wisdom to be upon us, to understand your word. We pray that God, your Holy Spirit, will open our eyes as we open up your word. Open our eyes to see wondrous truth from your word that's so relevant to our life. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will work so mightily and graciously in our hearts that your word will distill from our head to our hearts as conviction, deep convictions, Lord. This is our prayer, and use me as an unworthy servant, Lord, to teach and preach your word this afternoon. We pray this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Verse 1, I put here, there's no need for an accidental leader. Church do not need an accidental leader like one that I told you about the show. He, he was kind of like a hero but he was totally grumpy unwilling throughout the whole process and in fact he was a petty thief 
you know, who stole something along the way. You know, so the church don't need such kind of leader. We want leaders who serve joyfully. We don't want to come here and serve and want to get their job over and done with. No, we don't want this kind of leader. We, we want leader who, verse 1 says, look at the verse 1, it says, you want leaders who aspire to be an overseer. And it is a good thing. Some version put that it's a noble thing. Some version to say it's a, it's a fine thing. But the word really means it's a good thing to do. It is a good desire. It's a good desire. You know? So what does it mean to have such a desire? Well, whatever the meaning is, it, it has this implication that we want leaders who are willing, who desire to serve God and serve God's people. And we want to do it joyfully. You know, we don't want one who is dragged, dragged into the leadership role or conned into or scammed into the leadership role. No, we want a leader who doesn't want to come here and just treat it as employment. You know, I'm paid to do this job, I just have to do it. No, no, we don't want that. We want a leader who serves joyfully and willingly. Neither do we want a leader who volunteer their, their service to serve the church and then turn around and say, hey, don't demand too much from me. You know, I'm, this is my volunteer work. No, no, we don't want such leaders. No, we want leaders to serve willingly and joyfully. You know, Paul says, if, if it's such a, a, a desire, it is a good thing. It is a good thing. But willingness is not the only criteria. Because if that's the only criteria, then it's quite dangerous. You must imagine in, in Ephesus, in Paul's time, there are many willing false teachers and false leaders. They are so willing to do the job. They are so willing to take the pulpit. They are so willing to, to lead and teach the law. Remember in chapter 1, they are so willing to teach the word of God. You know, so willingness is not the only criteria. So we ask ourselves, what is really required for leaders to lead Christ's church for him, on his behalf? So verse 2 to verse 3, I put there the leaders that we really need. You know, first, verse 2 begins, by the word of God, Paul says this, he says, we need a leader who is above reproach. This is a criteria, above reproach, and really means beyond blame. Beyond blame. It means someone cannot point the finger and say, ah, this guy's life cannot make it. You know? But don't get me wrong, the, Paul is not saying, the word of God is not saying we are looking for a perfect leader or a sinless leader. Because such leader does not exist. Right? So what is Paul saying? I define this above reproach as this, is someone who does not persist in sin or unrepentant in sin. Or they are someone who does not persist or unrepentant about their ungodly attitude towards sin. They know they have sinned, but they are unrepentant even in their attitude towards sin. So this is someone who does not do that. He is above reproach. You know, so in other words, it is about his character. It's about his character. So you see a whole list over there. It's at least 10 to 11 items, verse 2 to verse 3. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go through them. But the key focus is this, that we must understand it, what Paul is focusing on is character, not capability. It's godliness, not giftedness. You understand? It, it is a focus. It's not that we look for purposely people who are not gifted, un, un, uh, 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 incapable. No, no, no. But the key focus is that we look for people with godly character in the first place. So we have to understand this, the principle behind each of these items or this, this list here. You know, but we are not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to pick up four and we're going to uh, discuss just four, for example. What is the principle behind each of these things. First, we say it's a husband of one wife. That does not mean that in order to be overseer, you must be married. No, that's not the meaning behind. Neither does it mean that if you are, you, if you are a widower or you are an unmarried person, uh, you cannot be a, a widow, you must be married, then you can be an overseer. No, I think the principle behind really means fidelity in relationship. If a person is dating, and he's single-minded. You know, he's not doing some kind of multiple dating, you know, meeting this girl, then texting the other girl, then uh, uh, lunch for, with this girl, dinner with the other girl. No, no, it's not. You know, even if he's not married, he has to be single-minded. You know, if he's married, then he has to be faithful to his wife. 
for better or for worse to death do they part you know so fidelity let's take a look at the other one the esv version put it as self-control well the meaning really uh, uh, is not given to extreme someone who is well balanced well balanced in what well well balanced in the emotion you know given to extreme when he's angry he doesn't turn green and become a hawk you know and he when he's thinking he that he, he has a broad thinking he has a balanced view of both sides of stories he's well balanced in his reasoning uh, he's not extreme in his actions or appetite too you know he doesn't see food and attack the food and uh, all the way eat unhealthily this is his extreme uh, extreme appetite neither does he like just eat grass you know it's like there's only healthy thing they only eat grass you know so then force everybody to eat grass with him you know no it's not it's, it's, it's a balanced person it's not given to extreme yeah, i'm going to explore two more with you um able to teach you can see one category there but didn't i just say it's character but able to teach seems like a ability you know but yes it is a definitely that it that includes the ability but what is the principle behind this ability to teach of course an overseer the lead of the church must be able to lead the church christ church you know, through the way he handle and communicate god's word carefully and clearly to god's people right yeah, but behind this i think there's a principle for them uh, for, for the kind of character that's needed for him to in order to do this you know i put there he, he must be at least be first be hard working to understand the text work hard on understanding the text he's not lazy he's he don't just copy from commentaries you know and and copy people's sermon no he, he doesn't do that he, he work hard on understanding the text you know second i think he also need to work very hard in communicating whatever he understand the truth to the people so he need to, all this need hard work work hard in understanding work hard in communicating the text you know so hard working is definitely the character one of the character behind this principle of able to teach you know and but we also must understand in the context of ephesus church you know letter of first timothy there are false teachers and there are false prophets who are teaching so able to teach i put here there's one other uh, character that needs uh, that's needed behind this ability to teach you know, i put here as a godly courage to defend the gospel in the face of fierce opposition and a godly courage to live it out against the barrage of attacks from all the false teachers and false prophets you know you dare to defend it and he dared to leave it out even though it may make him very unpopular it may make timothy very unpopular and all the elders that he choose the deacons that he choose or, or, or sorry overseers that he choose become very unpopular but he needs some kind of godly courage to defend the truth able to teach last one if they put that not quarrelsome or another version put that as peaceable is not excited to see fight that's what it means not willing to argue or fight for things that are unimportant you know, there are people who love who love picking fights you know and they love to have non-stop argument you some text over you will see 20 texts coming back you know over one word over that statement over that push stop over that comma there you know they, they will they will just continue you know and uh sometimes we, we, we i just came back from a, a, a ep retreat and i sometimes talk to some fellow pastors and elders and deacons and sometimes when they talk about their acm it's a, sometimes can be quite a scary thing you know it's, 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 it's a acm become an arena for fights and quarrel you know so it, and it's non-stop somehow non-stop so it's a quite a scary thing you know so many years ago uh i think elder jonas and Pastor Vincent will testify to this. Uh, 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 AGM meeting in the Senate, not, not at Presbytery level, it's even higher at the Senate level. You know, there was an elder and a pastor who argued all their way through, and when they cannot get their way, they shouted into the mic, stomped out of the room, and slammed the door. You know, so I, I wasn't there to see, like, thankfully. You know, I, my heart may just fail. 
you know so <laughs> yeah so so this is this this qualified person who's quarrelsome right to he's so quarrelsome this qualified him to take the lead role as an overseer now what so what the church need is not a perfect sinless leader because such leader doesn't exist what the church really need is leader who are above reproach not merely looking at the, char- uh, the capabilities or eloquence without any character can you see it is someone who's above reproach who do not persist in or unrepentant about sin or the sinful attitude towards sin you know, in fact they show christ-like character yeah. so but besides personal character the leader also need to be exemplary at the home front you know, so I put the pattern that we need, verse 4 to verse 5. Allow me to explain what's the principle behind these two verses. He said, overseer, an overseer must manage his household. And the managing here doesn't mean you have to sweep the floor and you have to wash the toilet. You have to make sure that all the books are in the correct place. The word manage really means, if it's made out of two Greek words. It's coming forward to lead or to give direction. You know, forward and direction so you're so coming forward to give direction or to give, to, to give a spiritual direction or to lead this is and one observable way that a leader or the overseer is could be found doing this is the way he managed his home through their children education again you must understand what's the principle behind this when he manage his household it doesn't mean that you do not have children if you're married, you know, and you cannot be an overseer. No, that's not what it means. What you must know, what is the principle behind this? And I like to put here, the principle means the person is responsible in all respect over his children and his home. You know, and he says, manage, manage his household with dignity. And we have studied this word before in chapter 2, verse 2. Remember the word dignity really means gravity of things, the grave importance of some things. And he focused and prioritize on the important things. It focus and prioritize on the right thing. And I don't suggest to you, maybe the four things that a, a father would do to manage spiritually his household. Number one on the top of priority is the relationship with God. His relationship with God, his wife's relationship with God, his children's relationship with God. Not just academic. It's their relationship with God is above all things. And you will definitely be providing for the children, but you also teach the children how to manage the body, how to be responsible over their body, taking care of the body, eating healthily, and keeping themselves fit. Relationally, to be someone who is loving, loving their siblings, loving the parents, and not be a bully. And of course, the child to take responsibility over their duties. If they are student, then studying is their duties. Service at home is their duty. Service in church is their duty. They will teach their children to be responsible over whatever duties. And if the children fail, the father will make sure that he steps in. He takes a spiritual lead to correct the child, to rebuke the child, and if needed, to punish the child. And we make sure that he is either done by him or his wife. But in any case, the father must make sure that it happens. You know, so, the result is that the child will be submissive. And I put here submissive really means the child will be open for correction and is not overly protected or spoiled. You know, so his submission doesn't mean he become a yes man or yes, yes girl, you know, yes boy or yes girl. It, re- it really means that the person is willing and open, humble enough to, for correction to be done in his life. It won't be a case when, when someone in, in school when someone in school or in, or in the family gathering, like a relative or in church, or someone correct the child and the child is so surprised, like, why are you to correct me? Why are you correcting me? The child wouldn't be surprised that someone is even correcting the person. It wouldn't be a strange experience because this is something that the parents have been teaching the child. You know, so the child's heart will not be hardened. You will not be proud. You know, neither were the parents over here, the father, Make sure that, make, making sure that he's not overprotective or spoiling the child. So let me give you an example. Many years ago, when I was still teaching the youth or was a youth leader, 
in a church. That's about 2,000 years ago. And uh, yeah, very, very long ago. I was teaching in a class below, in a multiple, multi-purpose hall. Then I was teaching about, there, there were the time there were about 40 youths and all this, so I was teaching the class halfway. Then one boy barged into the room, making a lot of noise. Then we tell the boy, okay, we're having a class, can we please go out? The boy making a lot of noise, walk through the whole house. If you know, if you know remember the layout of our multi-purpose hall, this is house, and he walked through, making a lot of noise, then went out again. Then he came in the second time. Then the third time. Wow. Then, of course, I brought the boy aside. I give him a good warning. I said, we are having a class. You better stop coming into... Well, I'm having a class. You are disrupting the class. You know, you must understand why I was uh, so fierce. Like, I mean, I was... Uh, <laughs> I was approached to be a discipline master before in my, in my school. So you can imagine how fierce I can be. So I bring the boy one side. Uh, yeah, if you don't know who that boy is, let me just show you the photo. But that's 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. The boy is different now. He's totally different. <coughs> you may not recognize this boy. He's, uh, he was now he's tall, handsome, and a fine, good boy. You know. Shh! Don't call him. <laughs> Yeah, so this boy here, yeah, so, so I, I scolded him. Then you must understand his father is the elder of the church. And what was I? <laughs> I, I never say who, I never say who, but uh, I was not even a deacon, I think, or, or, or just became a deacon, I can't remember. I was probably just a youth leader. So I, after scolding him, I went to his father and told his father, you know, uh, your boy has been coming into class to disrupt the class. You know, so I scolded him, and this is what I said to him, da 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 okay. Do you know what was the response of the elder? The elder said, very good, thank you so much. At home, I'll go back, I'll talk to him again. If it need be, I'll probably uh, discipline him. I was like, woo -hoo. <laughs> it, It's not overprotective, you know. And now you see the boy grew up 2,000 years later. <laughs> tall, dark, handsome. Yeah, so, but he, we, we can see the leader here demonstrated this humility and appreciate people, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to correct the children, and so as to bring the child up in the fear of God. I better put his face away. <laughs> yeah. Why is this important? Well, I put here because the overseer, being the head of the household, <clears throat> he cannot stand forward to provide any spiritual leadership if his house, his own home, he cannot put things in order. Verse 5 says, and the reason says, if he cannot do that, he cannot manage the household of God or the church of God, which is also called, also called the household of God in verse 15. You know, it's, it's called the household of God. So you can see, I put here, this is the pattern that we need. Is Christ the head of the church and the overseer represent Christ, manage the church. And the similar pattern is needed for God of, is the head of a family. And the head of a household, the father, has to do that, has to manage his family. You know, is the real ruler, of course, is God and Christ. The leader and the father is a mediator leader. We represent Christ in the family, and therefore, if he does it properly, he can represent Christ in the household of God. You know, so this is a pattern that is set up over here. That's why verse 5 says this. And this verse, verse 5, only appears over here. The next passage for a deacon, it doesn't have such requirement. It's not that the house can be run, but it's just that there's a specific statement that the overseer, as a house, head of a household, has to represent God to do this. So one of the implications I put here is that the key lead of the church as an overseer is a spiritual leadership role for a man, a head of the household. <clears throat> our church, there's a one reason why our church <coughs> do not ordain women elders, overseers, or ordain women as a key lead pastors. I know we have a lot of questions on this. We will address this later. But this is one of the reasons why the, the, the church has this stand from the scripture itself. The word of God says so, we dare not do otherwise. You know, and Christ needs, the church needs, sorry, the church needs leaders who possess such godly 
personal character, but not just that, but also who demonstrates such spiritual leadership at home. But apparently, there are also dangers facing potential leaders. Verse 6 and 7, I put out a devilish danger. Why devilish? You look at the verse itself, just within these two verses, the word devil appears twice. You know, so Paul warns the overseer that they cannot be a recent believer. But he did not state how recent is recent. You know, he didn't put a timeline there. But there's a reason because it is a principle. It's a principle, the spiritual principle behind this verse when it says it cannot be a recent believer. He, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the person must be 10 years or 20 years, then automatically the person will be qualified to be an overseer. No, no such thing. He doesn't put a year there because we have seen people who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and they still remain immature. And their thinking remains worldly. And their character remains ungodly. And their knowledge of the word of God remains very little, very shallow. So, so there's no year put on to it. But what it really is the, the, the implies here, the principle behind this, is not how many years. But I think the principle really is talking about maturity. A person is mature, exhibiting godly character as what is mentioned above in you know, previous verses, and is responsible over his family in the four verses uh, mentioned above, verse 2 to verse 5. So, and this sometimes have to be observed through times, have to observe through times, you know, and putting an immature believer up in a leadership position, especially in this case, we are talking about the key lead, the elder or overseer. It is a very, very dangerous thing, you know, and <clears throat> So, one thing we must understand, being theologically certified is no guarantee of spiritual maturity. In our context, we will take anybody, in a Presbyterian context, we will take anybody who is theologically certified and say, oh, this one can be the pastor. But there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee. No guarantee of spiritual maturity. And in our church history here in Dong Chai, past, in the first 26 years before Pastor Vincent came, we have seen actually immature people put up as leader, as elder, and who wreck havoc to the church before. And we have seen in the first 26 years of this church, we have witnessed pastors who are theologically trained, but it done great damage to this church. We have, we have seen that, you know. So, it's not the number of years, is really looking at the character, godly character, personally, and also responsibility over his family. And what is one key reason? The word of God says here, he will become conceited or puffed up. That's what it means. <clears throat> he will think that he's above the rest. And I put here in Luke, he says that whoever exalts himself will be humbled. You know, because he will exalt himself so high, he will be humbled like the devil himself. He will face or fall into the condemnation like that of the devil. You know, in Genesis 3, if you remember, the devil thinks that he's so high up and he became the lowest. He was crushed even by the seed of the woman, Christ himself. Because when they think that they're high and equal to God, God will bring them down. That's why he will face the condemnation of the devil. Why? Because such leader, when they're immature, they will not understand, and they do not understand what is the true understand, the true meaning behind a leadership role. They won't understand that being a leader, ultimately and above all, is a role of a servant. It's a role of a servant. It is to carry that spiritual burden of the church as an overseer. What he does as a leader is to serve the church by meeting the needs, the spiritual needs of the people that he's serving. He has to point them and direct these souls to Christ and not to himself. It is a role of a servant many times go un uh, uh, untanked in the first place. You get me? 
So this, this is not new. This is exemplified to us by Christ himself. Jesus himself said this is for the Son of Man come, not to be served, but to serve. And what did he do? He met our deepest spiritual need by giving his life as a ransom for all of us to redeem us from sin. This is the example that he showed us. And a leader must understand this. If not, he thinks that he's taking up some kind of rank, increasing in some kind of ranking. You know, that is a very, very silly thing and a very dangerous thing. Yeah. And being a leader, Paul says here in verse 7, he wants to set the record straight that his testimony must also be seen by the outsider as exemplary. Good conduct or good reputation. Can you see verse 7? He said he, can, he, he cannot be, <clears throat> he must be seen by the outsider, people outside the church, to have good reputation or good conduct. What is the principle behind verse 7? I put here, he cannot live a double life. He cannot be a hypocrite. You know, he's such a nice elder in church, a nice pastor in church. Then, when he is outside, when he's spoken of off by his colleagues and neighbors and clients, he's known as a boss or customer or a neighbor from hell. You know, it, it cannot be. It is so dangerous if he's a hypocrite. You know, he will fall, scripture says, into the disgrace and snare or trap of the devil. You know, what, so I put that, the, the danger is this, that he will discredit the gospel that he preaches, that he's proclaiming. People will laugh at the church and say, so, this is church. People, it will be a disgrace to the Lord Jesus that we are worshipping. It's a snare, it's a kind of quick trap because if the leader has some conscience, a little bit of conscience, he knows that his life is not right, he would dare not speak about his faith. If he behaves unruly in a restaurant, if he's a tyrant boss, he's a demeaning, belittling employer at home to the helper. You know, so he he will not be able to open his mouth and talk about the gospel if he has some sense of conscience. So and the helper, the devil is happy. This is a trap of the devil. The devil is happy when the key lead, the, the key leaders, the pastors, the elders are so silent about their faith because they dare not talk about it anymore. Can you see? So it is a very dangerous thing. And they dare not talk about their faith as if their faith didn't even exist. They go through 10 years of reservists, then they huh? You are a Christian? Ah? People didn't even know. The people who work under them, huh? This boss is a Christian. They didn't know. You know. It will be a disgrace to and discredit to the gospel that we are preaching. So in summary, I put here, the, leader, the church leads, needs leaders who are willing, especially we are talking about over here is a key lead, the overseer, who are willing with godly character, not merely looking at capabilities, not merely looking at their gifts, their eloquence, and I think if who are responsible at home and with a good level of maturity without hypocrisy. <clears throat> How do we apply this? Well, some of us may be thinking, hey, I'm not the leader type, so not applicable to me. No, we can not be more wrong than this. I think there are three levels that we can apply this. First level, three levels of replication. One, leaders at this position. We are speaking to all the leaders who are already at this position of uh, overseer. Not many. Elder Gregory, Elder Jonas, Pastor Vincent, and Pastor Handsome. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, myself. <laughs> We ourselves, it applies to us directly, you know. So what must we do? We must constantly check ourselves against this criteria. We don't check ourselves how effective we are. 
We don't check ourselves because of oh, how many people you brought to Christ. We don't check ourselves based on how many mission trips you have gone to. No. We have to check ourselves based on these godly characters. And when we fail, not if we fail, because we will fail. I will fail. So it's when we fail, we must be humble and quick to repent. We must be humble and quick to repent. What does it look like to be humble and quick to repent? I think there are three steps as leaders we should do. <clears throat> we must intentionally create feedback channel. We allow people to know us, allow people who have the guts to speak into our lives, even though they may speak things that we do not like to hear. We must allow that to happen. Let them speak and thank them for it so that you know, hey, I'm doing the right thing. Who? Anyone. But maybe, sometimes, because all of us are married, then you know who's the best critic for us? Our wives. Sometimes we have to allow our wives to speak. You know, of course, they, they sleep with us. They watch us 24-7. They know what kind of person we are. And they are the, probably the best person to tell us what kind of person we are. Second, your children. Our children. You know, sometimes my, my daughters will kind of tell me, Papa, why you speak like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have to say sorry to them, say sorry to my wife, and we have, we have to watch ourselves. Allow feedback channel, you know. And when the feedback really comes to us, we must prayerfully be open for this feedback. Prayerfully, when it comes, why? Because this is actually a spiritual battle. When the feedback comes to us, it's a spiritual battle to fight against our own pride and our own sin. If we fail this battle, we fall actually into the devil's condemnation, into pride. Yeah, so that's why it's a spiritual thing. Third step, <clears throat> and when we fail, we must repent before God and men. We will talk a little bit more about this in chapter 5 when a leader falls in sin, when an overseer falls in sin. But nevertheless, we have to repent before God and man. If we sin against our children, we have to go to our children and say, I'm sorry. I don't know how many of us parents actually do that. I think we have to do that. Yeah. If we sin against our, parents, uh, our children in the first place. Well, this is the first level. There's another level. Applicable to potential leaders. I put there the deacons. Because before they become elders or overseers, the deacons are the one. But not just the deacons, because where do I pick my deacons from? The IDG leaders. We pick, up, pick them from the IDG leaders who are handling the word of God, who are teaching the word of God. You know, so in the same way, these three things must happen. You intentionally create feedback channel prayerfully open to this feedback and when we, are, when we know that we are wrong, we have sinned and we have fallen short in our character, we repent before God and men. So this is applicable to the next tiers of leaders. Of course, the next passage, which is for the deacons, we will talk about it again, you know, which is next week. But then, I think it's also applicable to all members, all of us in this room. You say, why? So I don't intend to be an elder or deacon. No. I think it's applicable in three ways. Number one, <clears throat> you must have a biblical criteria to choose a leader. Your criteria of choosing a leader must be biblical. That's one. Second, you also must have a biblical criteria for rejecting a leader. No, so you cannot choose a leader because he has the he's just eloquent or he's funny or he's a, he has a leader say. You know what's a leader say? Well, for those who don't understand, it's a leader say. You, know, you have the aura as a leader. You know, you just choose that the kind of leader. You know, no, that's not a criteria at all. The criteria is godly character and responsible at home, not a recent convert, which comes to a certain maturity level, plus it's not a hypocrite. This is a criteria. 
And you must reject a leader based on those criteria too. You cannot reject a leader because Si Tong this morning came in and he forgot to say hi to you. Then you, oh, never say hi to me, never mind. You see next vote. Yeah? Or because this leader is not pushing your agenda. This is not GE, you know. This is not GE. We are not pushing some agenda to, to help the SM, SME, la, to help the, uh, I don't know, the poor, la, to help the, the education la, or the disadvantage. This is not. It's not, it's not a GE. It's not to help the, you choose a leader because, yeah, Elder Gregory is going to push my agenda. Yeah, I'm going to vote for him. No, it's not your agenda. This is God's kingdom. This is God's house. You must understand that. Lastly, you need some moral courage to voice out. When you see me, Pastor Vincent, Elder Gregory, Elder Jonas, or any of the leaders violate any of these criteria. You cannot say, ah, I cannot. Uh, Pastor Gregory, me, very nice brother. You, know, you always buy me supper. You know, so I will not speak out. Like, you, are, you know, we are brothers. Cannot. You need some moral, moral courage to speak up, you know, and you cannot say, ah, don't rock the boat, don't rock the boat, you know, no, the church is happy, everybody's happy, let's don't do anything unhappy, unhappy. No, you have to speak up, but you cannot speak up because you want them plant to be planted here and he didn't plant it. No, <laughs> you, you speak up because you saw a character flaw according to the word of God. Do you understand this? It is so important for the church to be healthy we must look at the key leadership. It begins with the key leadership. Next passage, we'll talk about the deacons then. You know, it begins with the key leadership. You know, and the church, most of the time, go haywire because the key leadership goes haywire. You understand? Yeah. So why? Because the church needs willing leaders, key leaders, we begin with, who are godly in character, responsible at home, and a good level of maturity without hypocrisy. That's what we need in a church. Do we fail? We do fail. Leaders do fail, but leaders must be quick to repent. Okay, so I'm going to leave us with this reflection. How often do you pray for our present leaders and future leaders? Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that, God, you continue to examine us, me, in the first place, and all our leaders. Help us to be humble, to let your word examine us. Help us to repent when we need to. And help us to recommit our, our dedication to you and to your church for Christ's sake. That Christ may be honoured that the gospel may continue to be proclaimed without fear. We pray this in Jesus' name.